Is there anyone in the room that would like to be in the room? Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm going to start off with um, a look at little mini fakato, um, and then we'll crack on into the presentation with our wonderful guest today, Thomas. Um, and Thomas is going to be sharing uh, with us his film, uh, work in film and television um, through the lens of Pride, mm -hmm. our theme for this month. So, we all good, Andy? Yeah. Yeah, so. Tēnā koutou kato, tōrua ki ngā mate haere 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 atu rā. E mihi ana te mana whenua o ngā tūtoa me taranaki whānui. Kia tātou e tau nei, kia ora. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou kato. Welcome to the Creative Mornings. Um, for those of you who do not know me, I am Christine. <coughs> I am the new Wellington host of Creative Mornings Born Again. Um, and I'm excited to kind of get into it, I suppose. I'm going to use my Woo. new clicker. Woo! Woohoo! <laughs> that worked! <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thanks. Uh, big uh, shout out to our global sponsors, Mailjump, who have been helping us out for a very long time. Um, for those of you who receive the newsletters um, and uh, email events, that's all through Mailjump. Sent my first Mailchimp thingy the other day. It's quite scary if you're sending an email to like 900 people. <laughs> oh, that one. Uh oh. Uh oh. No? Oh, yeah. Cool. Um, and also, shout out, they have recently done um, kind of a big report, um, which is in the newsletter recently if you want to check it out. And it's about pricing your marketing services, if that is of any interest to you. No, that way. There we go. Um, and as you just pointed out, we've got quite a small crew today. And there is fluctuations depending on months and times of year and all that sort of jazz. But um, tell a friend, bring a friend, make more friends. Uh, it's a really wonderful community and I'd love to see it grow as part of being the new host. Um, so yeah, if you have any ideas or you want to get involved, please do reach out. Okay. Um, talking of volunteers, uh, shout out to our sort of monthly local sponsors and helpers. Um, so we've got All Good Organic with the, um, All Good Organics with the oat milk. Obviously this beautiful space at 257. Um, Sierra taking taking your photo over there. Yep, thumbs up. Um, Hype Entertainment for lighting, video, helping me out generally with this projector. Um, Paper People Pixels, we've got Faye over there. She's drawing live illustrations this morning, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> Um, and colour craft for these labels, I selectively chose the one that I didn't have to write anything <laughs> apart from my name. Um, and also we've got Libertine Blends Tea, Coffee Supreme um, for all the delicious caffeine needs, um, Antipodes Water, Fix and Fog Peanut Butter, Wellington Saldo for your wonderful toast this morning, um, and Six Barrel Soda for our speaker gifts. Um, Shout out to, who was I talking to before? Um, if anyone knows an awesome gluten-free uh, provider, that would be really cool, um, just to help those folks out. Yeah. Um, and also to the volunteers that help out, and my new volunteers that have kind of come this morning for the first time um, to help out. That's really wonderful, and I thank you so Woo! much. Woo! Um, <laughs> awesome job. Um, if you want to volunteer for our team, come and chat to me after. Um, if you're interested in like marketing, help you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> any of those sorts of things, please do reach out. Um, it's always good to have extra hands on deck and that back end stuff, even if it's not directly on the day. Or email us. Wellington um, Hashtags, ads, handles, social media. Find us on social media. We recently got, no, that one, LinkedIn! Woo! Woo! I think <laughs> Melissa and I were talking about this the other day. It's not a bigger thing, it's not as much of a thing in New Zealand as it is in the UK. So we're getting there, guys. Yeah. Um, and obviously our hashtags, and obviously this month our theme is Pride for August. Ah! <laughs> and no. <laughs> <laughs> it's the clicker. It's the clicker. It's not me. Other way. Uh. <laughs> Please. <laughs> there we go. Um, our wonderful illustration for Pride this month is done by Kayla Griffin. Griffin, sorry. Um, 
did not bring it up on my phone to read you about pride, but you've probably already heard it in the emails. Um, but it's all about expressing your personal voice and your identity and owning that. Now, I'm going to click through and introduce Thomas. Yes. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Woo! Round of applause, Thomas! We will play video first. One moment, please. <laughs> Look at my messy screen. Can you sound quick, Andy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit, maybe. It's going to thump in the night. Did you hear that? What was that? You got that goosebumps feeling. Flickering light. Footsteps, the feeling of being watched. Doors creaking and slamming. Someone in Manny's house. Well, you might just have a ghost. What do they want? Energy. Oh, like Wi Fi. How about trap? I love it. Tell me more. Little Apocalypse. Full season streaming now on TV and Z. Okay. So, um, kia ora everyone, I'm Thomas Kapow, um, I'm a filmmaker, film producer and um, writer based here in Wellington. I'm from the Mighty Hut Valley, I'm still based in the Mighty Hut Valley. Uh, <laughs> never leave the hut, you know, you can take the person out of the hut, but you can't take the hut out of the person. <laughs> um, and so Little Apocalypse has been my most recent project and my biggest project to date. It was New Zealand's first ever queer kids TV show, which was not what we did by design. We didn't pitch to make New Zealand's first queer kids TV show. It just happened to be that. Um, and that's kind of going to be the basis of my talk um, overall. Um, but uh, Little Apocalypse is about a teenage witch who accidentally summons a poltergeist while trying to manifest a text back from their crush. Um, but also, <laughs> it's about um, these two characters, Cole and Leaf, who are siblings, going through that weird stage where you're looking at your older sibling and wondering what's going on with them as they're going through adolescence, um, and kind of doing weird things like trying to manifest a text back from their crush um, with witchcraft. Um, and so Little Apocalypse kind of came at the end of a really, really busy year of my creative practice. I've been working in this space for about 13 years. Um, I started straight out of high school as an 18 year old. Um, and last year I made five productions. I had developed two feature films. I was the Wellington Regional Manager for 48 hours. Um, I was kind of going hyper, hyper, and I also turned 30. Um, <laughs> which has kind of led me to have a bit of an existential crisis about why I do this to myself, why I'm here. And I think as creative people, we often have these existential crises at big turning points in our careers, at big turning points in our, our practice. Um, and so I really was questioning my purpose. Like, why do I do this? Um, and that led me back to the little apocalypse, which I think is a really beautiful expression of my why. Um, a real, um, and and it, when we talk about the fact that it was the first um, queer kids show um, in New Zealand history, when I pitched The Little Apocalypse, I initially came up with it thinking about that relationship I had with my sister growing up and how as a 17 year old I was doing witchcraft, I was making spells and she was much younger and we would do it together and for me it was like filled with all this emotion but for her she was just having a great time and so I was thinking about the kind of stories I wanted to tell and I came, I came up with the, that, that as the nest egg and I was like oh well maybe I'll make a show about an a elder witch sibling and a younger witch sibling and my immediate thing that I went to was, oh, well, it will have to be a girl older sister. So it's going to be my big sister as a witch, and that's what I'm going to pitch. But then I started to go, oh, what, why am I doing that? Why, as a queer person, am I immediately like pushing aside my own experience? Because I, as a non-binary, queer, gay male, was the, was the witch. So I took my unconscious, my unconscious kind of thing where I was like, well, I can't tell my own story. I, my story isn't valid, and I ignored that, and Leaf came to be. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and we pitched the Little Apocalypse just as the story that I wanted to tell, 
and we had resounding yes from our funder New Zealand on Air and TVNZ. And so it was never a question that this would be a queer show. It would have queer characters that was already going to be part of its DNA because um, I was the storyteller making it. So um, that was the first decision, I think, um, in a long line of decisions <coughs> where um, my unconscious um, need to tell my own stories led to an active decision to make cultural change and make change with my work. And that's ultimately what happened with Little Apocalypse throughout its cycle, because then we realised, after we'd been funded, that we were the first queer kids show in New Zealand history, we're the first show that will have queer main characters. And in fact, in the, in the show, we never say queer. We don't say gay. They just exist. They just are who they are. Um, and so when we realised that they were going to be the first, we then doubled down on the gay. So we made, we made everyone queer, or pretty much everyone. And so Sunny, our beautiful poltergeist here, is also queer. Um, we have an, a range of other queer characters, which I'll show you in a later slide. Um, and so again, our unconscious, you know, we were, we were put in this position, we were able to make this show as diverse, underserved audiences. And so we then made, we took action, and we made everyone gay. Um, <laughs> so that kids like us got to see themselves reflected. Another, th another thing that happened through the process of Little Apocalypse was I was really kind of thinking about, um, A, we wanted to show a story of queer joy because a lot of the narratives that are told about our community often t happen to be trauma narratives and that's because it's a way to you know, great empathy. It's also it's also a very valid experience for a lot of us. Like we have all um, through history had a range of trauma that we've had to suffer through. But when I was thinking about the fact um, that when that is all you see of your community, that limits the ability for a young person to see what could else be possible for them. And so we wanted to give them an an alternative option of queer joy. They can be witches and ghosts and go through teenagehood completely fine and be accepted ultimately by their sibling and also be messy and moody and problematic um, and it's all okay. But I was also thinking about that real specificity of um, being a non-binary femme AMAB human as a teenager and trying to have romantic feelings and those kind of internal struggles that went on and so I wanted to have a bit of a thesis statement for um, for what I wanted to tell young queer kids. Um, and that is, um, that again became an active decision I made in the storytelling. So then we've got a little video to show you. This is from episode five. It's a bit, you know, far into the series, so spoiler warnings, but my friend was telling me that spoilers don't ruin the experience, so you can still go back and see everything that came before and everything that comes after. What do you want now? She's gone. Oh, I apologize, and now she's close to me. What if she never comes back? I'm pretty sure about Dickinson's face, Tom. Seems some years too. Oh, 
Vamos. Hit my granny limit for the day. Can I use your data? Sure. It's dead to me. Cool. So that was my thesis statement for why I wanted to tell this series overall. I wanted to tell young, queer, femme people of all, you know, backgrounds that their femininity was their superpower. And I wanted to have that echoed to us from people that we care about the most, which in this instance was Leith's little sister, telling them that their femininity was their superpower. And that um, was something that I wish as a kid I'd heard. And so when I think about the little apocalypse um, being my purpose, um, ultimately I got into this this world <coughs> by some active decisions of other people to give me a chance. And then I was making unconscious <coughs> decisions that led to me intrinsically telling <coughs> the stories that I wanted to tell. That then led to me making active decisions to shift the dial and, sh and make change so that people like me didn't have to grow up with the same way I did with not seeing myself reflected ever. Um, and that's that's my plead, pleading to you all to please think about that in your own creative practice around um, A, empowering voices other than your own, and B, around um, your own unconscious blocks for your own selfness and letting, breaking through of those and being a beautiful queer fairy and flying <laughs> and letting it out. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about some of the other active decisions I've made in my creative practice. Um, so this, this, by the way, is all the queer characters that have ever existed in my work. It's actually not even all of them. There are more. This is all just from Little Apocalypse. And this is from Tragicomic, this is from Happy Playland, this is from Gay Crash, which was just part of um, NZIFF. And then this is from a documentary I did called Ultimately That's Polish, that's a poet there. Um, and so I, I have, by being enabled, have created all this queer story, and all these queer people that people can, you know, imprint on. Um, and so another active decision that I've made in my creative practice, which again wasn't, wasn't, it was just something that I felt was the right thing to do. I've always worked with women until last year. <laughs> um, so I've, I've pretty consistently worked 100% with female um, director writers up until last year where I've worked with a queer male um, on, on their first project. So um, I, I've been kind of thinking about my creative practice a lot in the last year since doing Little Apocalypse and thinking about um, what makes a project something I want to do. And over the course of the last year, um, having made the Little Apocalypse, it's become really clear to me that as a, as a person who's gotten to this point in my career, the stories I need to tell and uplift are my own community stories. And so I'm now exclusively making content either by queer people or about queer people, but if it's not about queer people, then it's got to be by queer people. So basically, only by queer people. Um, <laughs> um, and the other thing that I've done in my cruise, this is Little Apocalypse's team, and this is a team of 80% women and gender diverse people who are the crew on our production. And that was an active decision I made. And I've, I've seen a lot of work in the um, creative space to try and diversify crews. And something that has become really intrinsically obvious to me, because you look at a CV and men or, or cisgendered straight men will often have the most experience. Um, but I make an active decision to always look for a woman, a person of colour, a gender diverse person for the same roles that I'm hiring. And so I make that as an active um, decision to diversify my hiring pool and it leads to crews like this. It leads to, to sets where um, I'm surrounded by people who understand my rhythm and um, enable me to prioritise mental well-being. Um, and that's not to say that beautiful, straight, cisgendered men don't do that. It just means when you get a team of majority <coughs> women and gender diverse people, the rhythm is different and the rhythm suits different people better. 
Um, and so that is another active decision that I have made and continue to make and implore you to make, and it's one that can't be done unless you choose to do it and you make an effort, it's hard. Um, so ultimately, um, I, I think what I'm trying to say <laughs> is that when we empower diverse voices, unconscious decisions become creative drivers of change. And someone made that decision for me, and I make that decision with every creative person I work with. And then they make beautiful unconscious decisions that drive change. And so we effectively become this beautiful little, little problematic like um, web, <laughs> web of people trying to change the world. And um, that's that's what I want us all to be. That's I think that's the end of my talk. Questions. Mm -hmm. Woo! So thank you very much for choosing diversity and representing many different types of human experience. And how do you get your people? Um, so a lot of it's the, again that thing where I say it, I kind of say it's unconscious or it started unconscious because the people that I supported were my friends, so they were the people that were all around me. And then kind of as I've grown, um, it's been that, that web has just grown and grown and people have heard about me and so we find each other, you know, because we've all got that same, we all want to change who's ultimately telling the stories and so we, we come together. Um, yeah. You said that you started when you were 18. How did you actually get started? Nepotism. <laughs> um, so, so I couldn't get a job at McDonald's. Um, I worked at a pet shop all through my, my youth. Um, and I was a drama kid, so I actually thought I'd be on screen, not behind the scenes. Um, and I was going to go to university and study sociology and religious studies. Um, but we told my granddad, who had been in the industry years and years ago, that I was looking for a job and he was on the board of um, Natonga Sound and Vision at the time. And so he knew a bunch of people, and he ended up calling a local film producer or TV producer and being like, hey, give my grandson a job. And she was like, no. And he was like, <laughs> just sit there and read. And she was like, okay then. And so I went in, and on my first day as this nerdy, like, shy kid from Nine Eye, I was given a list of people to get on the phone, and I achieved it, which kept me around. And so I changed my degree <laughs> from, um, Sociology and Religious Studies to Film and Media Studies and I worked as a um, very lowly paid intern and PA in a production company um, which again like was luck like there's a lot of this that I think is um, luck and chance and who you know and asking the, th the beautiful thing I've learned about New Zealand though as I've continued on in my career it's so small like everyone knows someone who knows someone who knows someone um, and as New Zealanders, we're also so much more responsive to someone like randomly cold calling or cold emailing us and giving free advice. And so um, that's, the, that's the advice I give to young people now, is just like reach out, just like put yourself forward. Um, because that is the only way, and it will open doors, because we're desperate to have people. We shouldn't vote, it's bad. We shouldn't ask people to come and do it, but we do. We're like, come, come, join our family. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, is the film online? Yeah, so it's on TVNZ Plus. TVNZ so Plus. Um, yeah, so you just have to have a TVNZ Plus subscription and you can watch the whole thing. It's all available there and spread it around to all your friends and family <laughs> yeah, and absolutely. queer kids, but also, you know, queer adults who have like permanent adolescence. <laughs> <laughs> when you say subscription too, you can create a free account. Yeah. Uh, you, can, you just like log like in your account and then you can watch yeah. it. And there's a bunch of other stuff. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. What's next on your horizon in terms of your life? So I'm currently, um, like I say, I'm fun employed, I'm self employed, and I'm between projects, but I've got a whole range of things in development with a bunch of like beautiful. Um, practitioners and filmmakers and I'm working towards my first feature film, so that would be yeah, exciting. Very cool. Yeah. So, 
Um, the between projects, self-employed, technically unemployed. When you're searching for that next project, do you still put yourself out there, or are you yeah more often now kind of getting leads back from projects you've already done? So I like everyone, I still have to pay my rent yeah. Yeah. Oh, and my mortgage. Um, so I've kind of structured my life um, in my career and practice to be able to like afford to live on minimum wage and still do this main. And then I've also got the beautiful privilege of having a partner who's unfortunately funding my existence <laughs> between that and a new stick that we built um, yes. in the good times. Um, and so I'm, I'm always, um, in this last couple of months, I've been hustling for money. Um, because um, being working in film and TV production, I'm a slave to a funding round. So I'm basically waiting for the next funding round that I then don't hear about for the next three months. Yeah. And so um, intrinsically, I have to balance um, working in the space that I want to work in with doing other kind of side activities that are related. Yes. Um, and so that I think that's the, the, the toss up and the the puzzle that we all have to solve here. Yeah. Um, when you were in your like crisis moment, um, was there anything you did that like helped you get through it and find some of that clarity? Um, I stopped. <laughs> yeah. Stop working. Me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just um, returned to being a human for a bit because I think um, as creative practitioners we do this because we love it. And so um, that sometimes clouds us in um, remembering to also be a person. Um, and luckily, I had the um, I had a delayed COVID trip to Japan come up, and I got to go away and be away from it all and get to be a human again. And it, um, it was this really interesting moment of going, oh, hold on. I don't actually have to be a slave to my passion. You know, I can also be a human, and it, it feels like I've woken up, you know, since, <laughs> since I've delivered Little Apocalypse and, and taken it to the to audiences and um, and shared it with with communities. I feel like I'm like finally awake again, and I'm able to be myself and not just a producer who's trying to make stuff. <laughs> yeah. So um, I definitely recommend stopping. And if you can't afford to go to Japan. Uh, <laughs> go to a, a little little quiet town, um, turn off your phone, and just be a human. Yeah. How did you get back into it after something? Um, well, did you find it hard? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Um, I, I think um, I've figured out a rhythm for myself um, and a structure for myself so that I don't go too hard too fast. So I kind of like pulse in and pulse out. And that's the beautiful thing I think about working for yourself is you're able hopefully to structure your life and your existence around your own rhythm as a human. And so um, it, it has been a matter of like pulsing in and pulsing out, being like, I, don't, I can't actually keep, I'm gonna go play Pokemon and shiny hunt instead. <laughs> And allowing myself to do that. So um, just yeah, being kind and, and slowly getting back in. And I'm still not fully back in. Um, but this is quite a lot. I mean, normally at home, you know, just thinking of my thoughts rather than in front of a room of people with a camera on my face. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So tangential. Um, you said there's the kind of rhythm to doing something you love for work and then having to step back and let that be work. Um, just out of interest, do you have any other creative interests that you fall back on when you can't be creative for work and need space to recover from that but still have some sort of creative spark? Do you? I write poetry. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is not, it's never going to be work for me. It's just how I <clears throat> express myself and it's often when I'm like walking down the dogs and I think about you know something going on in my brain and I write little terrible poems that probably have no structure to them whatsoever. <laughs> uh, probably like a, a real poet would look at them and be like, <laughs> but um, for me they're, they're a nice expression of what's kind of going on inside um, and it's, it's been something I've done since I was 14. I used to write little poems that walked to school about dead sparrows and for fun. <laughs> Awesome. Hey, 
Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Thomas. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know all of that. I knew vaguely about things, but it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And I'm going to get myself TV and Z on demand or plus yeah. or whatever it's called yeah. these days <laughs> and actually watch the whole series. Thank it's you. very cool. Awesome. Round of applause for Thomas. Coming to the Creative Mornings that I've hosted for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is probably some more coffee and toast left over if you need a snack before you head off to work. Um, the next event is a little bit uh, closer because we're combining with Slushed, Slush D. Is that how I say it? It's a convention with um, the Atom at Vic Uni. So we're providing the breakfast event. So the next Creative Mornings will be on the 8th of September as opposed to um, later in the month. Um, so you'll get, if you're already on the subscription um, email, you'll get that or else keep an eye on our social media um, for the announcement of that. And there'll also be um, a little bit of a difference in terms of how we run it. So instead of having an individual speaker or a duo like sometimes we have, um, it will be a panel talk with three speakers. Um, the Creative Mornings topic next month is simplicity and the Slush D topic or theme is sustainability. So we're kind of combining those together, um, thinking about the simplicity of sustainability. <laughs> um, so we've got some amazing speakers lined up, um, and we'll be announcing those hopefully next week. So I hope to see you there. Bring a friend, tell a friend. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.